Hi, everybody. It's Marcia, aka Star Sister, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with Anamit von Helsingen, who is one of my favorite people on the planet and whose work, I think, really speaks to the heart of these unprecedented times. Um, when I look, every time I look at um, the astrology of this year of 2020, I'm just blown away. I've been looking at planetary listings, ephemerides they're called, since the 1980s for over 35 years. And I've never, and I've been going back. I love to go back and look at, oh, what was going on back then in the 1700s or the 1500s? I've never seen anything like what's happening this year. Um, it's being alive in this time for the first time as long that I've been studying astrology, being alive in this time is even more overwhelming than the astrology. We literally are, this year 2020 is, it's a, a, a portal of metamorphosis. Um, our world will not be the same in January, on January 1st, 2021, and neither will we. And that creates great questions for us about how do we how do we cope how do we deal with the huge waves of energy that are transforming our reality our lives ourselves and just as important how do we hold space for something new to enter the world because we're the spaces where it's coming. I think about these questions all the time. And whenever I do, it's just a very short period of time before I think about Anami and the Academy for Soul-Based Coaching, which she founded. Um, her life's work really is addressing the two questions that are the most important ones facing us. How do we deal with this intense, powerful process of metamorphosis? How do we hold the space? How do we become the space where the good future can enter the world? So when I heard that Anamik was offering a workshop on these very questions and issues of holding space, a free workshop, I, I wanted you um, to be able to, to hear from her firsthand what she does and to understand, like I do, why it's so timely and potent now more than ever. So with that, Anami, welcome and thank you so much for joining me this morning. Mm. Morning, so afternoon. Much. Yeah, it's afternoon on this end, but I think this is very much a global, global dynamic that we're in. So it's in a way, it's very fitting that we are spanning halfway across the globe with just this conversation. It's a real pleasure yes. to be here, Marcia. Mm, thank you for having me. So Anami, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you see the art of holding space, how these times are, are, are they changing how you understand what it means to hold space, deepening it? Um, I think, yeah, I think actually we had a, um, a call with our trainers from the academy this morning. And one of them said, well, this is the times that we've been, we've been practicing for, like this is what we've been getting ready for. Um, and, and all I could say was, yes, and we haven't graduated yet <laughs> in the sense that this is very much the time that these skills of holding space are needed. 
like they've always been needed but they're like so needed right now and the and it is a practice it is not something that you flick on and off it is something that with the intensity of what's happening it really is something that um that requires coming back to that practice putting our roots down again and really looking at the you know we have some guidelines that we use when we hold space to really revisit and just kind of see how we can stay true to ourselves when we're holding space and not get sucked into the vortex because i think this is one of the things that is so so valuable right now there's a lot happening out there right there's so much turmoil on so many areas um you know we can we can look at covid and all the ways that that is still in you know influencing our daily lives we can look at all of the racial tensions that are happening in the us but also in europe and in different places of the world um the, the, we can look at the economic economic implications of all of this as well like the, there's so much happening so many people losing their livelihoods so many people really having big questions about so what does the future hold for me and therefore it's really easy to get swept up in all of that emotion um and especially if people here um our our empaths are really good at feeling um energy or emotion from other people as well like that will be a thousandfold um um Uh, oh sorry what's the word like amplified in terms of what's going on inside of you so it's like there's a lot that's going through our system there's a lot that is asking for our attention and so practicing to really connect with yourself have your roots down like actually feel the earth feel your body feel your breath in the moment like that's the first place to start when we want to hold space and then we can start to hold space for ourselves too so we can start to actually go okay so all of this is happening for me right now in this moment and just to be with that for a while um and that is like if we don't do that we get swept up in all of these currents and tides that are happening outside of us that are from the collective that are you know we need to pay attention to what's happening inside of us because that's the birth chamber right you're you're so beautifully saying that this is a you feels like this is a time for big change like the kind of change that I'm not even sure I wanted to be part of but hey I'm here so apparently I wanted to be part of this and now that I'm here it's my duty to be part of it too you know some days I feel very courageous and I'll go yeah of course it's what I'm here for and other days I'm like ah, um, right Um, right. this is why we're here so this is where it starts being part of this 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 space that we're holding together for this new better future to be born in we have to have to strengthen our ability to hold space and at, in addition to and i so i i can i feel daily the shift that happens when i really let myself come into my body really feel the breath as it moves through the body really let it move through me slowly but in addition what would you say are some of the key um activators that shift us from simply being being present to actively holding space in mm -hmm. the moment that we're fully in. Yeah. I mean, just present makes a big shift. Yeah, I think that's the that's like the foundational step, right? If we don't do that, we can't hold space. We're we're, we're kind of fleeing in with all of the stuff out there. So that is the that is like the the first thing that we need to do. And then we have um a couple of guidelines as I shared earlier um that can really be very practical in terms of what you can do to hold space and this is both for yourself and when you are holding space for someone else because what is it this holding space this is about really listening like deeply listening and re receiving and um witnessing and receiving the other person's experience without any intention to change it in any way 
so that it's allowed to be witnessed, to be seen. And then a really interesting thing happens because when we are witnessed and seen in our experience as human beings, then that experience starts to shift. It's a really beautiful thing. So it's a contradiction in terms. We want to show up and hold space without the, that agenda that it has to change things for people. So how do we do that? Okay, so we want to really focus on that. This is our part. And we choose when we do that, right? You don't have to always hold space for everyone indefinitely. So you can choose when you want to do this. But when you hold space for somebody, you start with letting go of the outcome. So you start with going, we all have this inside of us, right? These voices that go, oh, I want you to do this, or I would so love for you to have that experience, or if you would only do this, it would, it would make life lot so much easier for you. Like, let go of any of your outcomes. Just allow that person to be as they are in this moment. And that's a practice, right? I can still catch myself going there. I've been actively practicing with holding space for the last 15 years. Now the second practice is about letting go of judgment. So we're human beings, we're trained to judge in an instant, right? It's part of a healthy mind, a healthy psychology. It keeps us safe. And when we're holding space, these judgments will get in the way. Even if we don't speak them out loud, if we're just listening, if I have a really strong judgment about what you're telling me, you can feel that, right? You know that something is off. So again, we can have the judgments, oh, you should do this, or oh, it's because of that thing. Or it could be about, well, I can't, you know, it could be self-judgment. Whenever we notice any of these, we want to just like meditation, just say, oh, I see that. Let's, let's just allow that to go right now so that I can come back into this moment and be with this person who I'm holding space for. And our third one is that we want to open our heart and connect from that place. Like the yoga namaste, the divine in me bows for the divine in you. It's like we want to consciously connect with that part in ourselves and therefore with this part in someone else. Even when we don't, you know, you don't have to speak that out loud if that doesn't feel comfortable. But that person is so much more than this heap of mess or <laughs> beauty that's, you know, sitting in front of you. And, you know, we're talking about this when it's like too much, the stuff that's happening right now. But the same is true when somebody's really happy. You can hold space for them being happy and really allow them to be in that space of happy. Right, and then I'm, I'll, I'll try and kind of get us through this so that we can talk about the implications of when you do this. Um, but the fourth one is that you want to stay present and stay present in your body, like we just said. Like really notice when you're listening, do you still feel your feet? Right? Do you still feel um, your, your womb space, your, your belly? Are you still in your heart? So just that's something, again, to check. It's really easy to go off into our stories and projections about what somebody else is saying. So bring yourself back into your body. The beautifully, um, like the really wonderful thing is that um, something that will start to happen is called co-regulating. So when you are in your body and signaling that it's actually it's safe to be here right now, the person that you're holding space for, their nervous system is going to pick that up and they have much more possibility and allowance to stay in their bodies too. So it means that they can access resources that they otherwise couldn't access. So it's our job to stay in our bodies, to stay present in our bodies. Just by doing that, it's rippling out. It's so profound. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We forget about this. It works for our children too. If anyone has children any age, really, this has been a profound practice for me. <laughs> Having my girl like hurt her toe or whatever, or like going into just, just being there fully attentive, but not having the need to speak or make it go away, but fully attentive and responding to her. Of course, it's like not like she's in this vacuum. You can feel all the pulls and tugs at your heart and the discomfort of this pain that, that she was experiencing. And I think it's a, it's a great metaphor for what happens when we are with adults, when we are with our friends or with our clients, to really be there, be present. And with our 
ourselves. Yes. Yes, absolutely. With ourselves too. Yeah. So it's, and it's okay to notice all the responses that you have internally when you're listening and holding space. It's just that you don't have to act on them. Right. And so there is, I'll, I'll come to that, but I'll come back to that in a moment. But there's one more that I want to share with you first, which is that this is about cultivating a deep trust that actually this person, this world is going to be okay. It's going to be okay. They have a lot more resources than they are aware of in this moment. It's okay. And very often when you just give someone five minutes of your time, 10 minutes of your time in this way, without having you know, to tell them what to do or to share your own experiences, like to really just offer them the space, then you'll start to see that little things or sometimes big shifts already start to happen towards a more resourceful place. And we like to talk about this as their, their Shakti flow, their, their creative life energy flow starting to not be stuck anymore because we so easily get stuck in our minds and in our in, in our emotions so it's this never-ending loop of the of the reality that we that we know but when you're held space for then you really quickly start to go outside of that loop and you start to see different perspectives and feel different feelings as well so that deep trust that we have to cultivate so that we can allow this to happen that is a, a really core part. And I think this is what we're all being like majorly <laughs> invited to, to start to, um, um, to cultivate, that we can have this trust. And if you feel, you know, if someone is sharing something that they don't like or find really hard or do like, <laughs> can you just be silent for another 30 seconds? Like really present and not just thinking about what you're gonna say once they're done to, you know, talking, but can you just give them the floor for another minute? Can you do that for like another one and a half minute? Like really start to kind of see what happens when, when you do that. These are really small tweaks to make, it seems like, but they have a really big impact. And then there is one more, and that is that we want to step in when we no longer, when, when what's happening for our client, for this other person is no longer serving them. Now, this is a really tricky one because most people will start to interfere. So ask a question, share an example, share an experience, do it, oh, I hear you kind of response. Not because what's happening isn't serving this person, it's because they no longer feel comfortable not stepping in, right? Not sharing something. And that means that it can be really nice from a relational perspective when I tell you, oh, I hear you. But it also becomes about us then. It becomes a relational exchange from that moment onwards. And it means that that person no longer has the space to really connect inward and let that speak without any um, filtering, without any kind of what does she want to hear? Is this the right thing for this situation to share? Um, am I making myself clear to her? like all of that other thing that we subconsciously like really easily do when we're talking to people. So we want to make sure that we only step in when it's not serving this other person. And nine out of 10 times, that's not what's happening when people start to interfere. So this is the practice of like, okay, can we, can we give that little bit of extra space? Can I set, sit on my discomfort and just, tap into that deep trust and see what happens. You, can, you, know, you can always, of course, you can always ask a question or say something or give advice if that's still relevant after a while, but don't be so quick. Really allow this person to dive deeply into what they don't know yet because that will start to surface. It really will. I'm gonna make a, how does that affect you? How does it affect me? When you're holding space for someone, I would think it would be profound. Mm, it is. It is. Um, well, it's it's both. It's 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 sometimes it's really challenging because I can feel all the triggers in me that are like all the buttons in me that are being pushed when it's you know a topic that I'm 
very familiar with or that I have my own experience with. So I'm really reminded of what it's like to be me, right? To live my life. And at the same time, the more I can let that go, you start to connect in with this really deep connection with source, which is like more than just my expression of life and this person's expression of life. There's something that really holds all of our experiences. And that is really nourishing. That is really powerful. And it's like it, it becomes this tangible field almost that you can lean into. So both for you when I'm holding space and for my client. That there literally is nothing that can't be welcomed in to be looked at. So would you say that without holding space for others, we're limited in our ability to hold space for life as it's trying to come through us as well. Yeah, without a doubt. I was going to say, if we don't learn, if we don't hold space, we're stifling life. Like we're really, there's no, I was going to actually say like the first words that were trying to come out of my mouth is that then there's no hope for us, <laughs> but I don't really like, <laughs> I don't really like that as a, as a, you know, trajectory to put out there. But, you know, we're, so we come from this, this paradigm, this, and, and you know more about this than me about in terms of where it came from and how long it's been around, but where we thought that life could be controlled, that we could think our way out of stuff, that we could you know, put our action plan together and as long as we follow through, it will happen and we have everything as we want it. But it's not like that. It really isn't like that. There is like, all the devils are out of their boxes now, right? Or actually, there's probably some more waiting, but like a lot of them are out there and we can't just put them back, <laughs> right? And, and so this is, this, is the messy, this is the messy side of the feminine paradigm. It's like all that life that we have tried to kind of push under and kind of try and make it behave is kind of going, well, hello, look at this. We need that. We really need that because the medicine that we need for that better future to start birthing is it's in there and we can't think it up. We can't even, you know, we can have great conversations, but then still it's not going to just pop up because that future comes from a much deeper place. And it comes from that place which our soul is in tune with. And this is why we need that depth. We need that space where we are courageous enough to say, I don't know what's going to happen. Right? So that's true when I'm holding space. It's true when I'm the person who is being held. Like, I need to be courageous. I need to really go to where I don't know. Because that's where I start to get new input, new insight. And each of us has that capacity and that capability. And that's how life gets to be reborn through each and every one of us. It's not because there's going to be a new, well, Obama, well, he's kind of my, one of my heroes, but, you know, fill in the blanks for whatever, when you're watching, whoever that person is for you. you know, we can't sit around and wait for that one person to stand up and go, well, this is how we're going to save us all. It's going to have to come through all of us. And it's in the really tiny little things, the way that you are with your partner, your child, or with your neighbor. It can be in the bigger things about how you show up in your life, in your workplace, or, or the conversations that you now choose to have with people that are not necessarily comfortable. But this is where it's going to happen. This is where it's going to have to happen. You know, as... Um hard as it is for us to truly trust the unknown, even when, especially when things seem chaotic, as old paradigms collapse. I think also that we all have experiences of those moments when we are able to trust and when we are able to hold that space for ourselves and for someone else. And those really are the most nourishing connections. And I don't you think that these times are making the other kinds of interactions where we're trying to control and judge and fix 
even more frustrating and unsatisfying and unfulfilling now. The old ways just won't work. Yeah. Well yeah. Then. And I think it's, um, I count myself lucky that be, by doing this work and by, you know, being in the practice, my tolerance for that not happening has gone down a lot which means that where I show up, I request other people to do the same. You know, I'll do it kind, I'll do it with respect, but I will not stand for people not having space for my contribution or my experience. Not because mine is better than anyone else's, no, it's because we need to be able to have, have all these experiences sit next to each other, because then we can start to learn about what's, what's needed. So I think it's a really good thing that that is so contagious. It's like when we've, when we started to see the inherent strength that is in each and every one of us, then we can start to pull back from the need to try and go over and fix things for other people or tell them how things should be. I think really our, our challenge now is to, to start finding that voice in ourselves, to really start looking for so what does my deeper knowing tell me? Which is not the mind, it's not the emotions, it's not the, the loops that we've been through again and again, though there's interesting uh, pointers in there. But what, what does my deepest knowing tell me right now? What is this about? An ongoing connection about that, to really have conversation and relationship where that can matter where what my knowing tells me can matter, what your knowing tells you can matter, and where, where we can try to figure out, so what does that tell us about the really practical stuff in life? Anna, I mean, do you feel that is a kind of interaction that needs, if not ideally people in the same space, but at least in the same space virtually as you and I are here mm -hmm. today? I mean, can it happen? I'm thinking about how much of our interaction happens in these online forums where we're not even present together on video, you know? Mm. It, so there's a whole dimension that's not there. Do you think it's possible to communicate in those ways? Yeah, I do think so. It's, it's, it's harder because you don't get to see the whole person and you don't get to like read their um, body language or their, their um, but I think, so I've seen over the past week, I've seen some really, you know, some groups that I belong to on, on B, you know, on the Facebook, uh, B school is one of them, um, but like different ones. Um, I've seen a huge difference between groups that are um, centered in, some groups have really blown up, right? Lots of, lots of um, fighting um, and um, you know, not so effective way of dealing with what's, what's at hand, what's happening in the world and, and what do we want with that in this group. Um, and others have been really supportive and um, still there have been uncomfortable uh, conversations, which I think is a sign of a good thing at the moment, um, but they managed to stay in connection. And I think there's, a, there's something about when we're on those online spaces about the, the ground rules, like the values that are held in that space. And that is something, um, again, which comes from, from practice, but also from, from living it. Like one, of the, one of the values in, in our online space from the Academy for Soul-Based Coaching is that we respect each other. So we can disagree, absolutely, but it has to be done with respect. Kindness is another value that we really, really subscribe to. Um, and so is curiosity. So knowing that we're never going to have the same experience, we're never going to look at the same thing and see and feel and understand the same thing. It's just impossible. No matter how similar we are, it's, it's never going to be the same. 
So we are trained to ask questions and not just questions about, so why do you think that? Or, you know, what, what made you do that? Um, but these are questions about, so what kind of is that? So I was just, I was just having a really interesting uh, experience on my personal timeline, actually on Facebook, where I'd shared a, um, a test, BuzzFeed test, you know, whatever the value of that is, um, about how privileged you are. Um, and it was a really interesting thing because it was giving a, a really interesting lens to look at the concept of, of, of privilege. So most people that, that comment and shared their scores and, and just kind of had a little of a bit of a, oh, I thought this was missing or I, I think I'm more privileged than that or like, you know, having a, like a, a reflection on that. One person came in and just left bullshit as a response. I was like, so this is really interesting. So this is my personal timeline. It's not in our community. But that is, that is not in accordance with being curious, right? That's not in accordance with wanting to be in conversation or in the relationship with me. So I don't care about, I don't care for that kind of comment very much. If that would happen in our community, my question would one be one. <laughs> actually, there wouldn't be a question. Honestly, it would be, please um, reframe this or don't do this. Um, and if people don't do that, then they're no longer welcome. That, that, this, just, that we have um, very little tolerance for that. But here I could ask them, what kind of bullshit is that? Just because I'm interested to learn about the perspective from these people. So just to give you an example of the kinds of questions that we can ask each other. So it can be an open question. It can be a, a non-judgmental question even when it's a judgmental answer, if we want to, right? So I'm just sharing this because there are ways of asking questions that really help people explore and give words to what this is like for them, that experience. And that is what we're interested in because I'm, I'm really not interested in the bullshit response. Uh, what I'm interested in though, is where does that come from? What are, what is the thinking, the feeling that is, what is, what is making this a logical response for someone um, to give? Um, that's where we start to really be able to build bridges. And that's when I can also share, oh, for me, it's like this, right? So that's when we can start to, that's when we are in conversation, when we can keep relationship happening instead of um, deflecting or blaming or shaming um, or going into guilt trips. You know, we don't, we don't have to do that. And I think this is part of what we have to learn to make online conversations um, worthwhile, like, so that they can serve that future, that better future to be born. And I think that's uh, some learning that we didn't do in high school. <laughs> it's, time to, it's time to pick it up now. Yeah. So um, you mentioned, had mentioned, mentioned something else earlier when we were talking before we turned on the recorder that is the other side of what you're saying here. And the bridge between the two, I think, is when things get edgy and how important that is to our ability to be real and authentic to what is actually happening. And the word you used, and so the opposite, I guess, from saying, putting bullshit in a comment, the opposite would be this word that you use, fawning, um, which seems like it's another way of trying to put the uncomfortable truths about ourselves or another or what's happening in the world or whatever it is to put them in the closet and lock them up you know? yeah because because we're good friends right because i know you're a really good person and, and i know we kind of mean well and yeah so let's just focus on that and let that uncomfortable bit just slip to the side yeah i think that's um you know it can be can sometimes be helpful um, depending on the context that you're in. Uh, but I also think that we have to, we have to dramatically increase our capacity for discomfort, like to be with discomfort and not act out, like in the sense of like push away or freeze or, or do the, the fawning response um, or fight it, right? It's, it's like we, we, we have to like increase our compassion 
and our ability to be in that space where you feel the discomfort and are willing to explore it together. Because making the discomfort go away is like our first go-to <laughs> tactic. <laughs> but the discomfort is here to learn us something. It really is here to teach us something about that thing that wants to be born. And it's one hell of a job. Anamit, can you tell us a little bit about what's going to happen at the workshop tomorrow? Ooh. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The workshop tomorrow, we're going to talk about how you can become a coach without answers. And um, people's responses vary greatly from hearing that. Like, what do you mean? A coach is supposed to give answers. Why do I pay a coach for otherwise? Well, maybe some coaches are there to give answers, but actually the kind of coaching that I think we need more of right now is the kind of coaching where you're like the midwife where you're helping the change that is here. It's wanting to be born through each and every one of us, where you're helping that be born so that, you know, that change process isn't limited by our abilities or our perspectives as a coach or, you know, my experience as a coach. Sure, I can tell you all sorts of really interesting stories and I have a lot of, you know, lived wisdom and all the rest of it, but it's still not going to help, help with that truth and um, that, that life that wants to be born right now, right? It's beyond what any of us know right now. So I think the most valuable thing we can do now is help people get to that place where they're tapping into their own deepest wisdom and we can help them guide the change that starts there, right? So we are skillful midwives more than the rock stars who go, well, you just need to do this and this is gonna be the next step and if you, you know, right? If you don't do it, it's on you, you know. Um, <laughs> It's not the kind of coaches that we need. So that's what we'll be looking at. We'll look at, so how come that this is such a, such a strange thing to say as a coach, but also we'll look at, so how do changes happen? So what do we know about that? Um, and then very practically, how can we start helping these kinds of changes be born? Um, so um, the aim is for everyone to go away with a different way of looking at change, a different way of looking at what, what you can add to that as a coach or as a healer um, and some very practical tools that you can start practicing with straight away, no matter if you're working as a coach or a healer or an astrologer or <laughs> whatever your, your modality is that you like working in. Even if you're not working, um, just you can use these in all the relationships that you have in your life. I feel the that I, I'm almost feeling like it's for this moment. And I do actually feel that we're all here for this moment. And in this, and by this moment, I mean, in, the, in, the, in cosmic time, our lifetimes are not even a moment. Um, but I do, we are in the midst of such an enormous shift. And this year, more than any year in my lifetime is the quintessence. I feel like we're really at the most delicate and powerful shift point. And I also feel as I listen to you, I keep thinking this is, this moment is what this um, life work of yours really took birth for. No pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for all of us. <laughs> say we, it's messy by definition. If it's not messy, it's not real. It's not really happening. We're not Absolutely. trusting enough. We're not being authentic enough, right? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think in, when we were chatting before, I also shared that quote from... Uh, to, um, I don't even know how to pronounce his name in English. It's Tolkien. How do you say his name? Yeah, Tolkien. That's what we say. Anyway, um, like the, the, the Gandalf, the wizard, saying something when, when Frodo says that he wish he wasn't born in this time. He says that it's not really up to us um, to decide what time we're born in, but it is up to us to decide what we do with the time that is given us. I think, there you go. That's it. We happen to be we happen to be here <laughs> um, at this incredible time. Um, we got to go to the belly of the beast. Yeah, we're the ones. 
Yeah. And you know, I, off, I, I really have come to believe um, after many years of looking at birth charts that if we weren't able to hold the energy pattern that each of us carries, we wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible for us to been, have been born at that time. Our, it, our, we would have been premature or we would have been very late, you know, that we, so we would, would have been born at another time. Mm. So I feel that just the fact that we are here means we are, it's, we're being stretched, no doubt about it. But the fact that we are here means we're, this is, we're the ones who can do this. And we are definitely the ones who are here. Yes. I we can't are. Wait. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's um, one of the things that I like about the work that I do is that it is really practical. Even though we talk about soul based, it's very, very practical. It's very in the moment. It is working with what's happening in the body with what's happening right now. It's staying out of all the lofty ideas about who we are or what we should be doing, but it's bringing it back into this moment, the experience that the client's having right now. And then when they're deep, you know, connecting in with that deeper knowing that they have, and that's enough. Right. I, I love that we don't have to go into, you know, castles in the air and um, or, or like get the whip and make people kind of do their stuff so that, you know, do their action steps so that they can have whatever it is that they want. And life doesn't work that way. Change doesn't have to work that way either. Um, and this change that we need right now, it's definitely not going to work that way. The beauty of what you just said and the truth of it is that in this way we bring so we realize that soul wants to be present in every single moment every single conversation it's not something we have to keep apart and separate from it no I, I think it's you know when i look back so i tried to do when i had my corporate career like it wasn't, I always knew something was missing, something was not right. And you see more and more people who have come to that conclusion. Um, and I think now it's the time to bring that to its full conclusion and say, actually, without that part of us engaged, it's like we're missing not just a part of us that gives meaning, but we're also missing the part that is our main indicator for where to go in life, right? doesn't make much sense to do that, does it? Mm -hmm. Not now. No. No. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have to say, when you say 2020 is like no year you've ever seen before, I'm secretly hoping, will it be over by 2021? <laughs> but it probably, we're talking about a large shift over a long period of time right but i think we are going to know by the end of 2020 because what happened astrologically 2020 is that in january our saturn our reality gatekeeper merged his frequencies with those of pluto transformative power so reality is being transformed you don't need an astrologer to tell you that. We just can read the headlines. At the end, and that's Pluto and Saturn conjoin every 35 to 37 years. But it, the rarest of all is when they conjoin in Capricorn, where they did in January. It's been in the last 1,200 years, since the middle of the 8th century, January was only the third time that they conjoined in Capricorn. And something equally rare is happening on the winter solstice of 2020. Saturn is merging his frequencies with Jupiter, the largest planet who we associate with wisdom and faith and abundance. 
that happens every 20 years. That's not the rare part. And every time it does, our understanding of the kinds of structures that we need to have in place so that we can access wisdom and abundance, we get a, a, an update in our understanding individually and collectively. But these Jupiter-Saturn cycles go in long periods where for, since 1802, everyone has happened in an Earth sign. And it's a very sad commentary on our understanding of the Earth and our ability to hold space for her, that those are the exact same years that we polluted, poisoned, really pillaged our planet. And now this year is the last year of 218 years of Earth sign conjunctions. And I don't think it's a mistake that in the opening months of this year, this final year, which is kind of a magical space between realities, the Earth, once we had all been sent to our rooms, has cleaned up the hole over the Arctic in the ozone layer. She's cleared the Ganges River. She's cleared the skies above every major city. Right whales are breeding off the North Atlantic coast. Nearly extinct species are proliferating all over the planet. She's showing us something about herself. So what's going to happen in January and December is that Jupiter and Saturn are conjoining, not in Earth, but in the most big picture, visionary element of all, air. The element that, by definition, listens and takes in other perspectives. The last time that happened was 1405, over 600 years ago. So that's so rare that when it happens, it's called a grand mutation. So mm. we can, astrologically, this year is, you know, we're having a reality transformation that is leading to a reality mutation. And you're right. It's not going to be over. And nobody's coming with a bag of pixie dust to sprinkle. And yet we're going to know the tide, is the tide has turned that the currents are moving in a different direction. And the more I firmly believe that we can hold space as you are showing us how to do, um, and will be showing us in even more detail um, tomorrow at, at this workshop that you're offering, the more we can do that, the stronger those currents can be. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm really, I'm rooting for all of us. Like when we have the capacity to be in the discomfort, when we have the capacity to hold space for ourselves, for each other, when we know how we can guide these changes that are so needed and when we can allow them to be born, then we really have a really good chance of leaving a different kind of society and earth to our children which i very very much hope that we do thank you again mm, thank I you i want to say over and over thank you thank you for being here with us today and thank you for your amazing work hi oh, you're so welcome same to you um should we we'll put the link to the workshop somewhere right yes so find okay. yeah post on Facebook and in the email um, that I'll send out to my list. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. And Thank I just you. not encourage all of you listening, can't encourage you enough to take part. As you were saying, one way or another, we're all coaches and healers for someone in yeah. some. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anamique. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.